Hey there, and welcome back to another Deep Dive. You know, this one's going to be interesting because we're tackling the COVID-19 pandemic response, and you've sent a ton of material our way. Yeah, it's a lot to unpack. It seems like you're really interested in figuring out where things went wrong, especially here in the U.S. Definitely. And you're right. It is complex. There are so many different perspectives and viewpoints to consider. But you've been doing some serious research, it seems like. A lot of these sources come from a pretty critical perspective. That's true. The material you've gathered definitely isn't shy about pointing fingers. You've got some strong opinions represented in there. So it's important for us to approach this with a critical eye and make sure we're understanding the context of these arguments. Okay, so one of the things that jumped out at me was this idea that the pandemic wasn't exactly a surprise. Mm -hmm. You know, all the chaos, the economic fallout, the societal disruption. And it's like some people were saying, we knew this was coming. We even have info on those pandemic simulations like Dark Winter and Event 201. Mm, right. And those simulations are fascinating because they really do seem to have predicted a lot of what happened Dark Winter back in 2001. They were looking at a potential smallpox outbreak and then Event 201 just a couple of years ago. That one focused on a novel coronavirus. And both of them, they really got into the weeds with this stuff. You know, mass panic, supply chain breakdowns, even the struggle to contain the spread of a new virus. Yeah, it's kind of eerie how accurate they were. They were talking about school closures, travel restrictions, the rush for a vaccine, all things we saw in real time with COVID. Mm. Makes you wonder, were they just scarily good at predicting the future? Or did these simulations actually influence how authorities responded when a real pandemic hit? It's a really interesting question, kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Did all that planning and simulation actually make it more likely to happen, or did it just prepare us for the inevitable? I don't know if we can say for sure, but one thing's for certain, these simulations definitely raised awareness about pandemic preparedness. They got people talking about these possibilities. And they definitely highlighted how complex these situations are. You've got governments, health organizations, scientists, the pharmaceutical industry, yeah. all these different players with their own interests and motivations. Absolutely. And speaking of key players, we can't talk about the pandemic response without talking about Dr. Anthony Fauci. He was front and center for decades in the world of infectious diseases. And the material you shared really digs into his career, going all the way back to his handling of the AIDS crisis in the 1980s. Yeah. And it seems like that's a major point of contention for a lot of these sources. They're highly critical of his approach to AIDS specifically his role in promoting the drug AZT. You're right. Books like Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s The Real Anthony Fauci, they really go after his track record with AIDS. They argue that he was too focused on AZT as the solution, even though there were concerns about its side effects and its long-term effectiveness. So they're saying he might have been too quick to jump on the AZT bandwagon, potentially slowing down research into other treatments. That's the gist of it. They also criticize his handling of dissenting voices in the scientific community like Dr. Peter Duisberg, who challenged the widely accepted idea that HIV was the sole cause of AIDS. Interesting. So you've got this thread of silencing dissenting voices, yeah. potentially pushing certain pharmaceutical solutions. And it sounds like these same criticisms follow Dr. Fauci from the AIDS crisis all the way to the COVID-19 pandemic at least according to these sources. Exactly. It's like they see a pattern in his approach to public health emergencies. And a big part of that pattern is this tension between the established scientific consensus and those who challenge it. Right. And during a pandemic, that tension gets amplified because you're dealing with a lot of unknowns and people are scared. So it's understandable that they're going to be looking for answers and they're going to be drawn to voices that offer them a different perspective, even if those voices are outside of the mainstream. Absolutely. And that's something to keep in mind as we go through this material. We're looking at things from the perspective of those challenging voices, the ones who feel like they're not being heard by the mainstream. OK, so let's follow that thread. You've also included a lot of information on the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. NIA, which, of course, Dr. Fauci led for years. What's the connection there? Well, the sources you've selected are really focused on the financial ties between NIAA and pharmaceutical companies. They're asking the question, how much influence do these companies have on research priorities, drug development, really the whole landscape of public health policy? That's a big one. Because on one hand, we want scientists to be working with pharmaceutical companies to develop new treatments and vaccines. Right. Of course. That collaboration is essential. But these sources are making the argument that it's not always a level playing field. They're pointing to the potential for conflicts of interest, where profit motives might be influencing public health decisions. Exactly. 
They point to things like the financial gains from drugs like AZT for AIDS and more recently remdesivir for COVID-19. And they ask, are these drugs always the best options or are they being promoted because they're profitable? It's a tough question. And it's not always easy to separate the science from the money, but it's definitely something to be aware of. Absolutely. And this leads us to another area where these sources get really deep into the weeds, gain of function research. Ah, yes. Gain of function. Oh. Always a controversial topic. For those who aren't familiar, could you give us a quick explanation? Sure. So in the simplest terms, gain of function research involves manipulating viruses in a lab, making them more infectious or more deadly. And the idea is that by studying these souped up viruses, we can learn how to fight them better, how to develop better vaccines and treatments. Okay, so it's kind of like know your enemy, but on a much more microscopic level. Exactly. But as you can imagine, it's pretty controversial. Critics say it's way too risky, especially when you're talking about viruses with pandemic potential like coronaviruses. Because if something goes wrong, you could have a leak from the lab and then you've got a global outbreak on your hands. Exactly. And that's what makes this whole conversation about gain of function research so relevant to the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's where things get even more intense. Yeah. Right. Because some of these sources, they're not just talking about the risks of gain of function research in general. They're specifically pointing to it as a possible cause of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. They're connecting those dots, drawing a line from that type of research to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which we know is studying coronaviruses, and saying, hold on a second, what if this virus didn't come from nature? What if it came from a lab? And they back this up with a few different pieces of evidence, mm -hmm. right? Like the fact that the lab was in Wuhan, which is where the outbreak started. Right. The proximity there is definitely something they focus on. They also point to the history of lab leaks. It's not like it's never happened before. Right. And then there's a the whole debate about the virus's genome. They claim there are some unusual features in there that suggest it might have been manipulated in a lab. Okay, right. It's like a giant puzzle. And we only have a few of the pieces, so we can speculate about what the bigger picture looks like. Yeah. But we don't have the whole thing figured out yet. Exactly. And it's important to keep that in mind as we move on to some of the other controversial topics that come up in this material, like the whole debate about ivermectin. Yeah, ivermectin. That's another one where... You've got a lot of strong opinions, yeah. some people saying it's a miracle drug, others saying it's dangerous and ineffective. Yeah. So where do these sources land on that spectrum? They're definitely on the miracle drug end of the spectrum. Books like Pierre Corey's The Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance, they really champion ivermectin as a potential treatment for COVID-19. And they point to some studies, right, showing that it can be effective. Right. They present evidence from multiple studies and sources that they say support ivermectin's efficacy, both as a treatment for people who are already sick and as a prophylactic to prevent infection in the first place. Interesting. But I know that the official stance from organizations like the NIH and WHO is that there's not enough evidence to recommend ivermectin for COVID. And they've even warned about potential side effects. So how do these sources address that? Well, they basically frame it as a cover up. They argue that there's a deliberate effort to suppress information about ivermectin, to downplay its potential and even discredit the doctors and scientists who are promoting it. So it's like they see a conspiracy to keep ivermectin out of the public eye. That's the narrative. They claim that powerful entities like pharmaceutical companies have a vested interest in pushing their own expensive drugs, like remdesivir, for example, and that ivermectin, which is a relatively cheap and readily available drug, poses a threat to their profits. Okay, so they see it as a battle between David and Goliath, with ivermectin being the underdog and Big Pharma being the giant corporation trying to squash the competition. That's a good way to put it. And they even point to specific cases, like Dr. Andrew Hill. He's a researcher who initially seemed open to the idea that ivermectin might be effective, but then he kind of backpedaled. What happened there? Well, according to these sources, Dr. Hill was pressured by the WHO to change his stance on ivermectin. They claim that he was basically told to toe the line or else, or, else what? or else risk losing his funding, his reputation, his career. It's a pretty serious accusation. It is. And it seems to tie into this larger theme that we've been talking about, this distrust of authority, this feeling that information is being suppressed yeah. and the dissenting voices are being silenced. Exactly. And that brings us to another major area of focus in these sources, the COVID-19 vaccines. One of these sources used the 1976 swine flu vaccine as an example, kind of a cautionary tale. Like, 
even with the best intentions, things can go wrong. Right. And they're drawing a parallel to the COVID vaccines, especially with how fast everything happened. They're worried about those long term effects, especially because these vaccines were developed and rolled out so quickly. It's true. It felt like we went from zero to 60 in no time. Makes you think, you know, where's the balance between urgency and caution? And, you know, that whole swine flu thing, it really shows how important public trust is. If people mm -hmm. feel like they're not getting the whole story or like risks are being swept under the rug, they're going to be hesitant about any vaccine, right? Totally. Transparency is key. People need to feel informed, not pressured. Well, uh, Which, speaking of, brings us to those COVID-19 vaccines, especially that mRNA technology. It all happened so fast, like warp speed. Yeah, and these sources point out that while the mRNA idea itself that's been around, using it in a vaccine like this, that was brand new. And they're worried, right, about long-term effects, especially given how quickly they went from it's experimental to everyone needs it. Right. Like, one minute it's all over the news, scientists in hazmat suits racing to find a vaccine, and the next minute it's available everywhere. Yeah. And speaking of everyone needs it, these sources, especially Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s book, they really go in on those vaccine mandates. Yeah, they see it as more than just a science question. It's a freedom question, you know? Like, yeah. where's the line between keeping everyone safe and letting people make their own choices about their health? It's a debate a lot of people are having. Absolutely. Like, at what point does public health become, I don't know, a little too big brother-ish? And it wasn't just the mandates themselves, right? It felt like yeah. you couldn't even ask questions about the vaccines without someone jumping down your throat. That's a big part of what these sources are getting at. They say instead of having an open conversation about vaccine safety, about whether they work, about the risks, any of it, people who disagreed, even doctors and scientists, they were shut down. Like, just trust us. We're the experts. And they say that just makes people even more suspicious, you know? Totally. It's like if you're so confident about these vaccines, why not address people's concerns head on. And then there's a whole big pharma angle. Some of these sources really go after the pharmaceutical companies, how much money they made, all that. There's definitely a thread running through these materials about conflicts of interest. Like, how much did profit motives drive the development and promotion of these vaccines? And did that influence the research or the way public health officials talked about COVID? Yeah, it's like, is this about science or is it about money? Makes you wonder. One source even called the NIAD you know, the agency Dr. Fauci headed up, they called it a pharma subsidiary. Whether you agree with that or not, it shows how worried some people are about these close relationships between government agencies and the pharmaceutical industry. Are they really looking out for the average person? Or are they too cozy with the companies making billions off these vaccines? Right. It's like, who's watching The Watchmen? You know, <laughs> who's making sure the average person isn't getting taken advantage of? That's a key point they make. People need to be more critical of the pharmaceutical industry, how much influence they have on policy, on our health choices. Well, it's about taking back control, right? Mm -hmm. Being informed and making decisions that feel right for you. And these sources, they don't just talk about the COVID vaccines. They bring up vaccines in general, the whole shebang. Exactly. COVID is just the lens. You know, they're asking bigger questions about how we decide what vaccines are necessary, how safe they are, the whole vaccine schedule. Like they talk about herd immunity. Does that even apply to every vaccine? And what about all the other things that have made us healthier, like sanitation, better living conditions, all that? Right. It's like they're saying, hey, maybe it's not as simple as vaccines good or vaccines bad. There's more to the story. Exactly. And they're worried about the long term safety testing, especially for kids who get so many vaccines on a schedule, all those different shots combined. Yeah. That's something I hear a lot of parents worried about trying to figure out what's best for their kids, all that conflicting information out there. It's a real struggle. It really makes you think, right? And at the end of the day, these sources, they're all about empowering people to make their own choices. Vaccinate or not, it's a personal decision. Weigh the risks, weigh the benefits, talk to your doctor, all that. Right. Informed consent. That's the key. But it feels like that's lacking sometimes. You know, like these sources, they're saying the whole vaccine conversation has become so polarized. It's not about having a real discussion. It's about do what you're told or else. Exactly. And that's the problem. Instead of encouraging critical thinking, instead of respecting different viewpoints, it's all about mandates and shutting down anyone who disagrees. These sources, they want to bring back that spirit of open dialogue. We're talking about people's health here. We should be able to talk about this stuff openly and honestly. Absolutely. It shouldn't be us versus them. 
It's about what's best for each individual. These sources, they offer a, a potent mix of perspectives for sure. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing that really jumps out is this deep concern about authority, you know, how much power maybe they grabbed during the pandemic. Masks, they kind of became the symbol of that whole shift. Okay, so yeah. unpack that a little. What is it about masks that, that raise these red flags in the sources? Well, they question if masks, you know, especially for kids in school, were really about safety, you know? Or did they become this this way to enforce compliance? Like imagine, right, okay. classrooms full of these kids, masked up for hours. They can't even see each other's faces, the expressions, all that. Wow, yeah. It's a, it's a striking image when you think about it, right? And it raises concerns, you know, about the psychological impact. I mean, we're talking about kids in their formative years. Right. It's it's unsettling, that idea. Like masks to control what children see, what they experience, especially at such a young age. Exactly. And this concern, it gets even deeper, you know, when you look at the science. One example, the sources highlight this Cochrane study, which, if you don't know, is like top tier for evidence-based medicine. They concluded that mask mandates made little to no difference in COVID transmission. Wait, seriously, hold on. This Cochrane study, what what did they actually look at? How did they how did they get to that conclusion? So they did a huge review, 78 randomized controlled trials. That's like the gold standard for medical research, right? They looked at data from all these different places, schools, communities, and they just didn't see it, you know? Masks, maybe a small personal benefit sometimes, but mandates, big sweeping mandates, the impact on overall transmission negligible that's that's huge if that's true then then masking school children little kids especially that becomes like that's really questionable it is and it really adds to what these sources are arguing you yeah. know that fear that control maybe even more than the science itself played a huge role in the policies the public health policies during those pandemic years mm. and you know it, it wasn't just about the masks right these sources they point to this bigger pattern like alternative viewpoints information getting getting suppressed especially about treatments yeah dr corey in his book he talks a lot about ivermectin right he claims it showed some real promise for treating COVID. Mm -hmm. So so what's his take on how, how all that was handled? Oh, he doesn't hold back. He describes this like this real resistance almost in the medical establishment, you know, to even considering anything alternative, even with like anecdotal stuff from doctors on the front lines like him. He's saying early treatment, focusing on meds that were easy to get, like that ivermectin could have made a huge difference in hospitalizations, even deaths. Wow. OK, so then what happened? Why? Why weren't these other treatments given like a real shot? Well, Corey suggests, and this is this is kind of big, that there was a deliberate effort to to suppress these treatments, maybe. And he implies this to push those pricier pharmaceutical options, the ones making the big bucks. Hmm. That's a that's a heavy accusation, you know, that available treatments, maybe even life saving ones were were sidelined. So so big pharma could cash in. Right. And and this ties into that whole conflict of interest thing, especially with someone like Fauci. Exactly. And Kennedy, and in his book, he really digs into Fauci's history, mm -hmm. you know, his ties to the pharmaceutical industry. He even says that the NIAD, Fauci's agency, was profiting from patents, like on drugs developed with, with government money, including, get this, the Moderna vaccine. Yeah. And he brings receipts, you know, cites that whole Associated Press investigation, the one that found out about all those NIH researchers, Fauci included, getting those royalty checks for inventions they made while working for the government. Hold on, hold on. Are we saying Fauci was like personally profiting off the pandemic here? Kennedy definitely raises the question. Now, to be fair, we gotta say, this doesn't mean wrongdoing automatically, right? But it definitely adds another layer to all this. It does make you wonder about about biases, you know, hidden agendas. And speaking of these sources, they also point to Bill Gates a lot, right? As a major player in, in the whole pandemic response. Right, it's interesting how they present him, you know, like with his money, his philanthropy, he's got this this huge influence on global health policy and, you know, maybe his intentions are good. Right. But the sources question if this laser focus on vaccines, maybe it came at the expense of like other important stuff. Like what? Give me an example. OK, well, they talk about his support for that muscurix malaria vaccine, the one in Africa. It had some pretty bad side effects, especially for young girls. So it raises the question, were the risks, you know, downplayed on purpose to to fit a certain agenda? And then there's the whole thing about him funding media outlets, right, to control how people see him, his work. It's it's a lot, you know. This idea of these powerful people shaping the information we get makes you wonder, 
Who is really in control of the narrative? Who yeah. interests are really being served here? That's the thing. These sources are telling us, be careful, you know, be smart about the information out there. Question what you're being told, especially when it's coming from people with, you know, with a lot of money, a lot of power on the line. It's a call for critical thinking. Yeah. Question even the people we're supposed to trust. And it goes back to those masks, right? Yeah. If if the people in charge were willing to to exert that kind of control so openly, what else might they be willing to do? Yeah, it's it's unsettling. And these sources, they they don't stop there, right? They start talking about the, the long term impacts of all this, this control. They even use the phrase biosecurity state, which is, well, kind of scary. Right. It is where it gets, you know, really interesting, but also a little creepy. They're suggesting that the pandemic, everything that came with it, all the measures, maybe it was like the first step, you know, <laughs> towards this future where where governments have way more control over us and they do it all in the name of, of safety, security, that kind of thing. OK, so paint that picture for me. Yeah. What what does a biosecurity state actually look like and how does it how does it connect to all this stuff about masks, hidden agendas, all that? Well, imagine this, okay? Surveillance is everywhere. I mean, everywhere. Your movements, tracked. Your data, they're scooping it all up. Mm -hmm. And your choices, even like small ones, right? Influenced or even straight up dictated by these algorithms. And the algorithms, what are they doing? Minimizing risk. But risk defined by, well, the people in charge, right? Man, that that sounds like, like a sci-fi movie, some dystopian thing. Are, are these sources really saying we're, we're headed there, our, our reality now? They make a good case, I'll yeah. say that, that it's all there, the, the groundwork for that system. Think about it. During the pandemic, the government, they had power like, like never before. Lockdowns, travel bans, quarantines, you name it. Oh, and the masks, right, all that stuff. Maybe it started with good intentions, mm -hmm. but it could be, you know, setting a precedent for what they can get away with next time. It's true. It's like we're, we're used to it now, this, this intrusion into our lives. A few years ago, it would have been unthinkable. And if, if the masks really were about, you know, obedience, conformity, like these sources say, then, then what happens next time? How much more freedom are we willing to give up? That's the question, isn't it? And these mm -hmm. sources, they want us to really think about that, the long-term consequences. Mm -hmm. As individuals, as a society, what are we choosing? Are we okay trading our liberty for a promise of safety? Where do we draw that line? This deep dive, it's been, well, eye-opening for sure. We've, we've gone to some dark places, haven't we? the potential for power to be abused, for stories to be controlled, and for our freedom, you know, just just chipped away all for the greater good, or so they say. Yeah, it's heavy stuff, but, and this is important, these sources, they're not giving us easy answers. They're not saying, do this, or that's the bad guy. You know, it's more like, think for yourselves, question, be careful. Exactly. It's about empowering you, the listener. You decide what to think. Don't just, like, Accept what you're told, you know. Yeah. Do your own research. Have those conversations, even if they're uncomfortable. Because the most powerful thing, right, against all this fear, this control, it's knowledge. It's thinking critically. It's talking to each other. Well said. Really well said. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive. And until next time, keep asking those questions, keep learning, and keep those conversations going.